Today I'll talk about how free software affects your fundamental rights. Um, yeah, so let's quickly go over what uh, the agenda we have for this talk today. So first of all, I will deal with some definitions. What are human rights? You know, what, what is human rights law? Um, we'll also take a look at the categories of human rights that um, we all enjoy. And um, yeah, we'll explore whether there are human rights relating to free software. And finally, we'll also talk briefly about how uh, free software can uh, affect or uh, enable the enjoyment of our fundamental rights. So uh, what are human rights? So basically, human rights are the rights that every person enjoys intrinsically. Uh, basically, that means that you know um, these are rights that you have by virtue of the fact that you're human. You know, you are born with these rights. You don't have to do anything to earn them, um, and uh, they cannot be taken away from you except in certain exceptions that are provided for uh, by the law. So this is the basic concept behind human rights: that everybody is born with them, that they are uh, available to you intrinsically, uh, and this concept is the basic foundation uh, on which all human rights law is uh, built upon. I mean, of course, you know, things get complicated down the line when we have to talk about uh, uh, things like uh, how to balance one right against another because, you know, people have uh, different values, people put different values on different rights, and that's where all the uh, disagreements uh, uh, on how to govern uh, with human rights comes about. So, human rights are universal. Um, yeah, as I said, that means every person is equally uh, entitled to enjoy these rights. Uh, hmm. And they're also um, inalienable. Uh, that means that they cannot be taken away from you or given away. So under human rights law, that means that they should not be taken away from you unless in accordance with uh, certain acceptable procedures or uh, situations. You know, for example, uh, let's say you have uh, the human right to liberty of movement or, or, or liberty and security of your person. But let's say you commit a crime and you're put in prison in accordance with uh, the law. You've had a fair trial and you've been put in prison. So what happens now is your human right to uh, liberty is being restricted, but that, restricted, uh, that restriction itself is not a violation of human rights law because it's been done in accordance with certain procedures. Yes, uh, as mentioned before, it's very difficult to balance these rights, how people choose to justify restricting a human right um, is always difficult. Uh, and so the exceptions under which your rights can be restricted um, is the basis of, like I said, every argument uh, in human rights law. So what kind of rights do we have? Um, it's, it's a very complicated uh, list, and it's a very long list, and I'm sure a lot of you have uh, an idea already of what kind of rights you have under law. So um, to simplify things, I will just uh, kind of categorize them into the two popular uh, or, or two uh, mainly understood categories of human rights law. Basically, these are your civil and your civil and political rights, um, as well as your economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, yes. So, civil and political rights are basically the rights that uh, ensure your ability to participate in civil society. Uh, yeah, without any discrimination or repression. Uh, so for your civil rights, you would have your things like your right to vote, your right to freedom of association, uh, your right to be free from discrimination, um, and also things like free, free speech, uh, freedom of religion and thought, et cetera, et cetera. And for political rights, these would be things like um, rights to a fair trial, rights to participation in a civil society and political life. Uh, the other main uh, category of uh, rights would be your economic, social, and cultural rights. So, um, yeah, these deal with rights that you, uh, you need uh, in order to um, enjoy a fulfilling life or, enjoy, or, or, or to be able to participate uh, meaningfully in society um, and economically. So these would th deal with things like, you know, your right to housing, your right to uh, education, uh, your right to health, your right to, be, uh, uh, your right to uh, adequate standard of living, food and water, things like that. Right, so, you know, when we talk about human rights, it, it tends to concern itself a lot with uh, very fundamental issues that go to the core of um, uh, human beings being able to live a fulfilling life. So many of these rights and laws, um, they were drafted in times when, you know, the most uh, technologically advanced thing that people had in their houses was a radio. 
uh, a lot of these human rights treaties were drafted after the Second World War. So um, the most important ones especially were drafted in 1962. Um, so I would say, you know, when these rights were kind of conceptualized, uh, they were done in a time where, you know, we had no idea, or, or humanity had no idea, of uh, the influence that you know the internet, uh, digital technology, uh, software would have on our lives. Um, yeah, but I think that you know even as the world changes, uh, the core principles of what we as human beings uh, uh, are entitled to enjoy in order to have a fulfilling life, uh, they remain the same. And we just have to figure out how to protect these core principles while we deal with the new challenges that. Um, digital technology brings with it. Yeah, and I say this because, you know, a lot of modern life these days uh, across the world um, depend on software. I mean, um, I think gone are the days where we can say that uh, participation in digital, um, in the digital space, uh, access to internet, uh, that these are uh, a privilege enjoyed by the developed world. I mean, even today we see now that, you know, it, these are essential uh, things, the internet and software, these are essential things even in, the de even in the developing world. And because so much of our lives depend on, you know, um, the functioning of software, it is vital that we are guaranteed some kind of freedom over software uh, and rights over software, um, over these tools that we see can essentially run aspects of our lives. Uh, yeah, you know, these days, um, an, an individual's uh, rights can be affected by how software uh, uh, operates, even if that individual chooses not to use software. So, how can free software support our human rights? Um, yeah, philosophically, I would say, you know, we maintain our freedoms by maintaining control over our technology. You know, think of how pervasive software is in, in everyday life. We use it to work, we use it for entertainment, uh, we use it even in our homes for everyday chores. Uh, you have software in your microwave, you have software in your uh, washing machine these days, you know? Um, and if you do not have some kind of control or transparency over any particular piece of software, um, your rights can and in most cases will be affected in some way. And I think the biggest human right that, you know, people always think about when we think of um, digital technology is the right to privacy. That's a very big uh, topic these days. Uh, yeah, we are all uh, affected by the services of big tech these days, you know, the, the, it's almost impossible to avoid its influence when you use the internet. Um, and we live in economic systems where it's very profitable for a lot of these big companies to harvest and sell off your data. Um, and, and of course, these actions violate your, your rights to privacy in the process. And so when you use proprietary software, you always run the risk that your rights are uh, being forfeit in some way, especially the right to privacy. So if you use free software, how does that help with privacy then? So one major factor of uh, free software is uh, community management, community motivation and dedication to ensure privacy. So we can see this happening in many uh, free software communities. I mean, one, one example is, um, in the early 2010s, uh, you had the release of Ubuntu 12.10, uh, 12 um, which started establishing um, uh, certain internet connections for local searches to uh, the uh, Amazon, to, to display Amazon ads and also to share data with Facebook and Twitter um, just by virtue of using that operating system. And uh, the backlash from the community was immense because they could see these connections being made through the code. And um, it was such a massive uh, uh, backlash that Canonical, which is the company that uh, uh, develops Ubuntu, uh, they had to respond and they ended up uh, removing online searches and the Amazon web app. And you know, more recently, the free software um, audio editor and recording uh, app uh, Audacity, uh, they also received loads of backlash because uh, they proposed adopting telemetry um, via the implementation of uh, Google Analytics and Yandex to its software. So yeah, the outcry from the uh, community was immense and um, it eventually caused them to, to, to renounce their plans to do so. So why is this relevant? You know, so if you have the freedom to, use the to study and to use the source code and the freedom to improve on it, um, it means that the source code is decentralized and you do away with single points of failure. Uh, or massive data breaches, and you also have a larger community 
uh, acting as a kind of a watchdog over uh, the software, uh, over what the code can and cannot do uh, uh, to its users uh, to violate their, their, their rights to privacy. Um, and yeah, from these uh, examples that I've raised, you know, what, you, what we can see is that uh, real privacy solutions uh, must start with free software. So another example, you know, think of your right to vote. Um, imagine if your country switches over from paper, paper voting to uh, uh, voting machines. Yeah, I mean, we just, had, we just saw an election in the United States where a lot of uh, uh, states uh, used uh, voting machines to record votes from uh, voters. So would you be comfortable if you, if you had the knowledge that these voting machines were being run on proprietary software, that you have no access to the source code and you can't see exactly what the code is doing to your vote? I mean, you have no um, kind of uh, ability to confirm whether or not the uh, machine is uh, intentionally or accidentally through uh, badly programmed code. You know, if it's actually changing your vote, if it's not recording your vote properly, or if it's not communicating your vote, you know, to a server where it's being counted, or et cetera. You know, what happens if something is written to, into the code to uh, discount your vote? In that case, your right to be heard as a, uh, a private citizen voting is being taken away. So we need this transparency to pre preserve our trust in democratic processes. And if we don't get tr transparency in the software uh, that, prepares, uh, 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 that prepares and processes uh, these procedures in voting, um, then this can have negative social um, effects. And it can also uh, reduce the trust that the public has in the democratic process. And if you think about something more broad in general, you know, your right to be free from discrimination. So um, imagine if you live in Germany, as I do, uh, and you are applying for a job. So you start sending out your CV to uh, lots and lots of companies. Um, some big companies, they receive hundreds of CVs a day for various uh, job openings. So what they do is they, uh, they use software to sort through their CVs. Um, if they're using a proprietary software to do so, there is no way that you can be sure that they are discarding CVs that for example, don't have a traditionally German sounding name. Or, you know, it, this, this creates uncertainty in your mind about whether you are being rejected from the job because you are legitimately not qualified or because, you know, there is some discrimination against you going on. So, yeah, with, without free software, there's no way that you can know for sure. Um, and there's no way that you can know if it's violating a fundamental right. With free software, if this is actually happening, you can hold them accountable for their actions and say, look, my rights are being violated, and I would like to uh, have this violation be rectified. So I'm coming to the end of my talk now. I'm running out of time. Um, our goal with this session is basically for you to uh, think about how software affects your fundamental rights and how control over technology uh, can help you to enjoy your rights as a whole. I mean, we can go through every single uh, human right um, that's uh, provided for by the laws uh, in the various treaties uh, that, that's adopted in the European Union these days. And I'm sure for uh, pretty much all of them, you can find a way in which software uh, affects it in a real uh, and practical manner. Um, and if software is such a widespread and compulsory tool in how we live our lives, then openness and transparency really is uh, essential to having positive outcomes to how it affects society uh, and in how we enjoy our human rights. And yeah, so on this note, uh, as we go through this uh, legal education track, um, I would like to ask all of you after today to think about your use of software, think about um, uh, free software and yeah, basically how it supports your rights and maintain a democratic uh, and open society. Yeah, thank you very much.